So in this video we're going to discuss the Leibniz Rule. Okay, so the Leibniz Rule is all about uh, trying to differentiate integrals. So uh, let's say you have an integral which is a function of t. So, and it has the form, um, the integral from x1, which is a function of t, to x2, which is a function of t, of f of x t dx. So what's the setup here? We have uh, some multi, multi so we have some function. We have some function which is a function from x uh, to the codomain, which is the real line function of x. And basically, we have lots of these. So we could add another dimension, which is t. And at each of these t, we could plot a new function. So given another t, we might have a slightly different function. So at this value of t here, we might have a slightly different function. And the function changes as a function of time. So uh, think of it as these functions of x all stacked alongside each other, and it's changing as a function of time. In addition, we want to take the integral of this function, integral of this function over a certain uh, portion, and we would like to know how does it change as we go along time? How does the integral change? But to complicate matters, we haven't just fi fixed two, uh, two uh, limits for our integral. The limits of the integral might change. So this one might go up, uh, this one might go down over here, and we might end up integrating this one behind uh, between those two limits, and we might ask what is the derivative of such an expression like that. And the Leibniz rule gives you a way of working that out. Okay, so firstly I'm going to give you the intuitive uh, version of how to derive the Leibniz rule. So if someone says to you, derive me the Leibniz rule, what is the Leibniz rule? You can just look at, think of this picture in your brain, i.e. this picture of functions, um, slices of functions or, uh, of this variable x, which change as time develops, this other variable t develops, and the limits of the integral also change. And we want to know, remember, we're not differentiating the function, we're differentiating the whole integral. So the integral is a function of time, basically. To every value of time, you're um, ascribing a value of this integral, and we're differentiating that. Um, if you think about it like this, we've got uh, a time function here, and we've got an integral function here, which is um, the uh, um, a real-valued function. So it just describes a number to each value of time, which is the integral of this function. Okay, uh, and how would you derive it just from looking at the picture? Well. The first thing to note is imagine the uh, imagine the the limits were not changing. How would you do it? If the limits were fixed, then how much would it change? Well, at one time we have a function f. Let's say these are the limits x1, x2, and we have this function f here. So f here, and this is at a time. And if we go to the t next time onwards, so let's say. Oh, Okay, so this was the function at a time t. Then if we go to the function at t plus dt, it might have changed a bit. Uh, well, not that much. It might have changed a tiny bit. So that's a bit of an extreme example of how it's changed. But it might have changed a tiny little bit. And we want to know how much is the integral dif uh, how much does the integral differ by? Well, if you think about it, the integral is like a sum. It's like the sum of all of these tiny little pieces. So if you think about it like that. Uh, so we can ask, uh, we can divide this one up into the exact same rectangles, if you like, the tiny little rectangles. And we can ask how much does each of the area of these rectangles change. And if we find out how much each of these the areas of these rectangles change, then if we sum up all of the changes of the each of these rectangles, so for instance if we take this rectangle and we ask how much bigger is this rectangle and we take that little difference and then we go to the next rectangle, ask how much bigger is this one and we add up all of those little changes then that will give us the overall change of the integral. Okay, so what? how much does each rectangle change? Well that's just going to be the derivative of the function with respect to time. Why? Because the value of the integral is f times uh, f is the height of here of this rectangle. So f times some tiny dx. Well, uh, dx isn't changing. We're assuming dx remains the same. So how much does the rectangle change by area? What well, changes by how much f changes? Um, so uh, the tiny little change in the rectangle is actually del f del x uh, del f 
del T, uh, dt, which is, so this, remember, is the ratio between the change in f and the change in time. The derivative is the ratio. It's how much the function changes for time. Remember the, def the definition. So we'll go back to the definition of what this is. f, uh, go up a bit, um, f of xt um, is equal to the limit as uh, dt approaches 0 uh, of f of x uh, t plus dt minus f of x t uh, so uh, divided by dt so you make this change in time smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and um, as you do so you get a smaller and smaller change in f of x so the change uh, in the value at that point gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller um, but uh, you divide it by this uh, decreasing dt, and you get that ratio between how much um, how much the time how much time you change by, and how much the function changes by. But it doesn't give you the absolute value that the function changes by. To get the absolute value, you have to times it by dt, and that's not rigorous maths. It's um, it's an intuitive way of deriving the correct results for calculus. So uh, you can think of it this way. It's useful to think of it this way. So that is by how much uh, each of these rectangles changes with respect to time. Um, uh, so uh, if we integrate that along x1 to x2, um, so um, then we will get the change in the rectangle, uh, the, ch the change in the whole area of the integral. Now let me explain why. So if you think about it like that. Okay, so... Uh, this is how much each little rectangle changes its area by. Well, in fact, it's not. It's how much f of x changes. How much does the area of the rectangle change by? It changes by dx, um, because uh, the length of the re the area of the rectangle is f, f uh, times uh, f times dx. Um, so how much does the area change by? This is how much the length of the uh, of this side of the rectangle changes by but the area is going to change by dx of that so we sum up all of those from x1 to x2 we get that this is equal to the integral d dt times the integral x1 x2 uh, d dt of f of x t dx and you shouldn't think of dt as um, dt is a applied mathematical concept it's not a rigorous mathematical concept it just means a length that is so so small um, but it's you can rigorize this argument of course but this is a nice intuitive argument just think of it as a really really small rectangle and as you make it smaller and smaller it's converging on this being true okay uh, so um now what we've done is that's the change, so that's the absolute change in the integral. So this is effectively i at t plus dt minus i of t. And we wanted to know the derivative, so we divide both sides by dt, and there we are. So that's how much the integral is going to change if, if, if the limit points weren't changing. Okay, so now what we need to do is alter our calculation, alter this in some way, so that we factor in the, uh, the fact that the, um, that the uh, limit points are changing. Okay, so, if this x, x2 is going to change by how much uh, if you change t by dt? So I'm going to swap over, okay, get a new piece of paper. Okay, so if you, x2, if you change it by a tiny amount dt, then how much is x2 going to change by? So if I redraw my picture of the integral that we're taking, so we have a function like this, and we're now asking how much is it going to change because the limits change. Okay, so here is x2, and when we go plus dt, it's going to change by some tiny amount, and that's going to be dx2 dt times dt, for the same reason we've discussed already, that, you know, dx2 dt is the ratio between the change in x2 and the change in t. It's the convergence of the ratio. It's what the ratios converge to. So if we make dt very, very small, then it's a valid approximation to say that the change in x2 is going to be the change in x2, uh, the derivative of x2 with respect to ti, times by uh, the change in time. Okay, um, so that is how much this limit is going to change. Uh, sorry, this um, this upper limit is going to change by. So how much 
actual area we're going to add on. Well, we could, if dt is very, very small, then we could just use um, f. Uh, we could just use what it is at f. What it is up here, basically. So we're going to add on this little rectangle here, and we can and we can say that if dt gets really, really small, the approximate value of that is going to be f of x2. Okay, uh, at that time t. So we get that the change uh, in the um, area because of this change in the upper limit is it go going to converge on being f of x2 t. So you tell me what the limit was, the upper limit was uh, t. So that gives me this value here, the value, of the length of the rectangle that we're adding on. You times that by this, um, the the. Um, bottom length, the base length of the rectangle, which is dx2 dt, dt, and obviously again, that's the absolute value, so when you divide through by dt, you'll get the ratio, so that bit, that term is going to be added on to our, uh, to our integral term here, uh, to form the Leibniz rule. Uh, and then we're going to have to do the same thing for x1. The problem is that if x1 actually goes up, what's going to happen? The integral is going to go down. You're going to take a bit off the area. So in this case, again, you let dt get really, really small, and the change in the change in the limit, it, the change in the lower limit, is approximately equal to dx1 dt times dt, and Again, we can assume that the um, that the height of the rectangle is approximately equal to f of x one t uh, at t. Uh, so uh, we want, to, but the problem is we're going to take that off. So we want to put a subtraction there, and again we want to divide through by the dt to get the ratio. So the overall Leibniz rule is that the derivative with respect to time of this integral from x one, which is a function of time, x two, which is a function of time, uh, f of x and the function varies with respect to time, dt, uh, d not dt, sorry, dx is equal to, uh, well first the um, f of x2 t uh, evaluated at t, so this term here, dx2 dt minus f of x1 t t uh, dx1 dt uh, and then plus uh, the first term that we came up with which is, where is it? It's there, plus the integral from x1 to x2 of the derivative with respect to time uh, f of xt uh, dx. Okay, so that is the Leibniz rule, that the derivative of an integral of that form is equal to that. So if I just circle this... And I hope that I've been able to give you my, the way, that's the way I derive it when I um, do it in my head. Where if someone was to ask me, um, what is the Leibniz rule? That's how I'd work it out. That's the quick way of working it out. In the next video, I will show you how to, um, how to get it from the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, which, isn't, uh, which isn't trivial. Uh, well, sorry, no, it, it, it's, um, it's, it is a proof what we're going to do in the next video. It's not it's not as intuitive as this, but we will prove it um, because uh, once we won't prove the fundamental theorem of calculus. I've done that in other videos. All the hard work goes into proving the fundamental theorem of calculus. Once you've got the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, this rule follows from it, which means that this rule works whether the integrals you put in there are the Riemann integrals or the Bayes integrals, because all of them, both of them, obey uh, the fundamental, the second fundamental theorem of calculus.